Good morning. The grace and peace of Jesus Christ be with you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, for all of the things that you've given us, for life, for freedom, for friendships, for all that you've given us to nourish us, and for food, for clothing, things we may take for granted. We give you thanks, for we know in Scripture that all good things come from above. We thank you for this time we have together. We've come from many different places and backgrounds, and yet in your spirit we've all been drawn together in this very place at this very time. And we thank you for your presence with us as we gather in your name. We thank you for songs that we sing together, for music that we hear that strengthens us. We thank you for the sound of children. We thank you for an opportunity to come in prayer before your throne of grace. We thank you for your holy scripture, which is read. And we ask that as we have heard with our ears and our that as we have heard with our ears, that we might retain with our hearts and our minds your truth. And in the moments to come, may the words which are spoken and the thoughts and the meditations in each and every heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Many of you know that when I was younger, I was a St. Jude patient. And during those years of recovering from the surgeries and the chemo and the radiation, I had trouble at times with my posture. And I had a teacher in the fifth grade who was a very wonderful teacher, a wonderful teacher who made sure that she commanded the presence of everyone in that room. She was a very proper teacher, and uh, she spoke in a very proper, subtle accent. And people would come into her class, and she would say, good morning, good morning. And I would walk in, and she'd say, Timothy, stand up straight. And I would shoot my shoulders back. Somewhere in the class, I would hear, Timothy, sit up straight. And I would again hold my shoulders back. Oftentimes, as I left, I would hear, Timothy, and I would immediately do <laughs> As time went on, I heard that less and less and less, until one day she told me how proud she was, Timothy, that I was standing so straight. In our scripture today, there is a woman in need of healing. And in a paraphrase, she hears from Jesus, stand up straight. And the problem occurred when Jesus did that. Because when he healed her, it was on the Sabbath in front of other people. And as the story continues, we discover that there's actually more than one person in that synagogue that day who had a crippling spirit. Jesus had taken pity on someone whose, the Bible says, whose spirit had crippled her for 18 years which means Jesus must have had some sort of a conversation with her during that time of being with her and healing her to know that she had been crippled for 18 years, that something in her spirit was contributing to this as well. But the leader of the synagogue began to publicly denounce Jesus and the woman who had been healed. On six days work can be done, he said. On six days, come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath day. We probably meant well. He was probably trying to just keep the law. But Jesus called him a hypocrite and pointed out that he would help his ox or his donkey on the Sabbath. Ought not this woman who is the daughter of Abraham be set free? The question of Sabbath has been an integral part of the Judeo-Christian faith. And it's interesting that this story about a Sabbath controversy coincides with people in the story who have crippling spirits. Perhaps it ought to serve to remind us 
that often when we come to worship on the Sabbath, we don't always bring peace. We don't always bring joy. We don't always bring happiness to our Sabbath. Sometimes we, like the woman in the story, bring things that are oppressing us. And the pressures of life, of sickness, of worries, of death and dying, of suffering and strife and anger and depression and disagreements and family problems can all begin to weigh us down until we, like the woman, can become bent with the burdens that are so very heavy. And Sabbath ought to be a time of burdens being freed. Remember what Jesus said in another place, Come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Still another place in the psalm says, Cast your burden upon the Lord, and God will sustain you. God will never permit the righteous to be moved. It ought to serve to remind us all that if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we could also be like the synagogue leader who brings a spirit that is crippling. And we don't even realize it. Sometimes we can become so focused on doing right, we even have the right intention, but our spirit, unbeknownst to us, can cause others to suffer if we fail to recognize the need for mercy. As we hear the story read today in Luke, where do we see ourselves in the story? Maybe we see ourselves in the woman who is so burdened down. Maybe in the leader of the synagogue. Maybe a little bit of both. Sabbath has been the cause of so much argument and consternation throughout the Christian faith. But we have to recognize this. Sabbath was created by God to be a joyous and freeing thing for, for us to come together and have an opportunity to worship God. But too often throughout the years, it's been a thing that has been argued about and allowed by our crippling spirits to be abused and misrepresented and oppressed. So today, as we consider the idea of Sabbath, as we hear the story of Jesus on the Sabbath, let's take a moment to consider the very meaning and purpose of Sabbath and worship. I want to hold up some things that we learned from the story in the midst of a controversy that Jesus faced. The first thing is this. Let's not overlook the very simple fact that Jesus kept it. Sabbath is not to be taken literally to the exclusion of doing good. Likewise, it's not to be taken so lightly to the exclusion of observing it. Perhaps the old saying is true. Sabbath is not to be taken literally, but it is to be taken seriously. Throughout the years, I think the church has made mistakes in both ways. But the question for us in the scripture today is, how did Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, the very creator of the Sabbath, the fulfillment of the Sabbath, how did Christ observe the Sabbath? He kept it. The commandments were given to God, by God to the people of Israel. And when God gave the commandments to Israel, God said to the people of Israel, I am the Lord your God who led you out of the land of Egypt. And then proceeded to give the commandments. And they took those commandments and they put those commandments, two tablets of the commandments, into the Ark of the Covenant. Now we often think about those two tablets as maybe five being written on one and five of the, on the other. But we need to picture those two tablets with ten written on the one and then ten written again on the second. Because in ancient times, just as now, each party got a copy of the contract. 
There were two tablets. One copy was for Israel. One copy was a reminder that God was keeping the covenant as well. It's important because God wanted everyone to know that God was remembering the covenant as well as Israel. Jesus was demonstrating that keeping the Sabbath was not a request. It was an agreement that even God was keeping with the people of Israel. Sabbath was the day not only for Israel to remember all that God had done and was doing and had promised, but also was a day for Israel to remember that God was remembering as well. And although the commandment to observe the Sabbath didn't specify going to worship, it implied it. Because the commandments were given to all of Israel. When the commandment said, you... It was plural. If it had been written in Southern English, it would have said y'all. So it would have said something like, y'all honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Because it's good that we come together. It's good when we're able to come together and we remember, remember all that the Lord has done. And we, we come together also to remember how the Lord has done such great things for us, and also to encourage one another. In Hebrews, it reminds us, let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day of the Lord arising. Besides, we observe the Lord's day because it's for our own good. Jesus reminded people at another place, that the Sabbath was created for us, not us for the Sabbath. There's an old story told about a logging camp many years ago in which there was a man that was a logger there and he was known for being able to cut more wood than anyone else. One particular day, a, a young upstart challenged the champion and said, I can cut more wood in one day than you can. And the day came and they began to both cut wood. And the young upstart had a lot of strength and a lot of vitality, and he cut and he cut and he cut, and he looked over at one point, and the older champion was sitting down, resting, and he smiled. He knew he had it, and he kept working and kept cutting. He only stopped one time, a short time, to grab a little bite to eat, and he went on all afternoon long. And it seemed like every time he looked over, the older guy was sitting there, resting, resting. By the end of the day, they counted up how much had been counted. But, and sure enough, the older man had cut more. And the young upstart, he said, I don't get it. I cut all day long. Every time I looked over, you were sitting down resting. How is it that you cut more wood than I did? And the older man replied, what you didn't see is every time I was resting, I was also sharpening my axe. And so it is. Sabbath. Sharpens us. Sabbath is good for us. And Jesus kept it. And Jesus, whenever he kept the Sabbath, also remembered to embrace opportunities for good. That day on the Sabbath, Jesus got up from Moses' seat and he went to the old, older woman that was there. She would have probably been in the back of the congregation. And so we can imagine him going over to the woman. Jesus allowed interruptions as an opportunity to do good in someone's life. Whenever interruptions come to our life, it's good to remember to be patient in understanding of those interruptions. Sometimes it's in the interruptions that we find the will of God. That doesn't limit itself to Sundays. Perhaps we all have times that we've set aside for devotion or for rest, and it's very important to take those times. But if that becomes a priority, a priority over doing good for someone, we've missed the entire point of Sabbath and rest. Oftentimes, it's in the interruptions, the interruptions of life where we, where we are visited by God's presence. Or God uses us to be God's presence to someone else. 
because it's in the Sabbath. It's in God's presence where the Sabbath occurs. C.S. Lewis once wrote this. He wrote, the great thing, if one can, is to stop regarding all of the unpleasant things in life as interruptions of one's real life. The truth is, he continues, is of course that one, what one calls the interruptions are precisely one's real life. The life that God is sending one day after another. Jesus, his own attitudes towards interruptions, even on the Sabbath, was to take it as an opportunity to do good for someone else to the glory of God. And as Jesus did that, he placed mercy over legalism. He turned to the ruler of the synagogue and he said, hypocrite. It's as if he were saying, you know, you're more bent out of shape than she was. To me, a scary thing about this story is not that the synagogue ruler was blatantly evil. Just the opposite. What's scary to me is that, in fact, he was trying to keep the law. He was doing everything he could to be right. But he observed the law so literally that he choked the very life out of it. Jesus kept the law by remembering the purpose of the law. The heart of the law was mercy. It's not that Jesus was throwing out the law but rather teaching that law without mercy cannot be. One can't keep the law without being guided by mercy. Later in Paul's own writings, Paul would tell, teach us that the purpose of the law was to teach us precisely that we couldn't keep it, that we needed a Savior. For Paul, it the law was to, to push us towards acting in mercy, knowing that we ourselves had fallen short and needed forgiveness. John Wesley himself once wrote, I have often repented of judging other people too severely, but very seldom have I repented of being too merciful to someone. Jesus demonstrates it's better to keep the Sabbath by doing good than to keep it by doing nothing. Sometimes we can hold on to doing right and being right so much that we miss the bigger picture. Back in 1999, as we were preparing to enter into 2000, and all of the talk was about the start of the new millennium, remember? Nobody Oh, now. Um, so there were some that were pointing out that, of course, you know, they said, the new millennium really doesn't start in 2000. The new millennium starts 2001 because there wasn't a year zero. Year one started everything. So 2000 years would be 2001. And this was something that people were saying. And I was one of them. And everyone was celebrating 2000. New Year's of 2000 was coming. The parties were coming. And I was talking to a good friend of mine. And he was talking about the parties that were coming. And I reminded him, thank you very much, that of course you know, I said, the millennium doesn't technically begin until 2001. And he was very patient. He was a good friend. And he was very patient. And he listened to this. And he listened to this. And finally, he looked at me and he said to me in frustration, Tim, you may be technically right, but I'm going to the party. <laughs> Point taken. It humbled me. The Pharisees thought they were right. And the synagogue ruler thought he was right according to the laws and the regula regulations. And of course, technically, they may have been right. But even though they may have been technically right, they were still wrong. It's possible to have all the appearances of righteousness 
and stillness the mind. Samuel Grinder once wrote in the Washington Post, if moral behavior was simply following rules, then we could program a computer to be moral. What kinds of rules are keeping us from God's will? What kinds of things are getting in our way of seeing the bigger picture? Family expectations. Business pressures, school culture, church tradition, our own habits. What's keeping us from seeing the bigger picture? I'm reminded of a time when I served as the associate of Jackson First, and there was a, an ensemble of the choir at Jackson First that would go around to little churches and from time to time perform at revivals and such. They were called Jubilate. And they went out to this little church that had very few people out in the country, and they had been invited to come and sing one Sunday evening, and they went out there. And they arrived, and no one else was there yet. And the door was open, they went in, and they sat down right at the front row. And they waited, and they waited. And finally, the door opened in the back, and a woman walked in and came in to the front and walked over to them with a nice, gentle smile and said, you must be the choir. Yes, they said. She said, we are so happy that you're here with us tonight. And they said, thank you very much. And she said, you're in my seat. <laughs> and they politely moved. What is it that we aren't aware of that's getting in the way of the bigger picture. What is it? We have to guard against those things. Sabbath is to be kept by Christians, but it's a lifestyle. And it's never to be so legalized as to choke out its very life. And to prohibit the ability to bring deliverance to a spirit that's crippled. Keeping Sabbath is resting in Christ. And it includes allowing others to rest in the goodness of Christ that comes from you every single day. And so it was a Sabbath to remember that Luke recorded in the scripture we heard today. When Jesus was there and brought healing during an interruption and didn't allow legalism to quench the thirst for righteousness. Timothy, my teacher said, stand up straight. And she would say that because she cared. And Jesus cared enough to heal that woman that day and to speak to tr the truth to that synagogue leader. And no matter your burden, whether it be physical or spiritual, or caused by the pressures and expectations of others, know this. Know that the Sabbath is for you. Correction. For y'all. And so listen to Jesus. Y'all, listen to Jesus. And stand. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our final hymn is printed in the bulletin. There's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. And as we sing our final hymn in celebration of God's grace and mercy in our own lives, let us truly sing it in a way that we're praying for that mercy to flow through us to others. If there are any here this day that would like time, for prayer or conversation following the worship service, there will be a Stephen minister standing near the banner to my left. And any prayers or conversations are kept in the strictest of confidence. If there's anyone here that would like to speak to a minister, me, or Brad, or Aaron, concerning a decision for Christ, or a decision of ministry, uh, ministry or a decision of membership, we would love to have an opportunity to talk with you about that as well. 
please see one of us, and we would love to work out a time to have a conversation with you as well. But let us stand as we sing our final hymn. Thank you.